I'm Catherine Robert from the French Embassy in Bern. Ladies and gentlemen, sehr verehrte Damen und Herren, it's a great pleasure to be here today for this, we hope, wonderful event in collaboration with the ETH. And I want to thank Madame Alexandra Krohn for the organization. So I'm very briefly going to introduce today's speaker, Hugo Duminil Copin. Vous savez déjà, bien sûr, qu'il a obtenu la médaille Fields l'année dernière. And I will also introduce Vincent Tassion from the ETH, who will do the moderation. So Hugo Duminil Copin grew up near Paris and he studied at the École Normale Supérieure in Paris and at Paris-Saclay, and he's today a professor at the University of Geneva and at the Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques, Saclay. And of course, he won the Fields Medal last year. I guess I don't have to explain. You all know there's no Nobel Prize in mathematics. There's the Médaille Fields. So we are very proud of him, of course. Vincent Tassion, who will do the moderation today, he is, of course, also a mathematician. He studied at the École Normale Supérieure in Lyon. And he then came to Geneva to do his postdoc with Hugo and has been a professor of mathematics here at the ETH Zurich since 2017. And without further ado, I will now hand over to Hugo Duminil Copin. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for uh, the kind uh, introduction and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Um, so, we are going to talk about math. I mean, this is one of the things usually when you hear a talk about math, it's quite often a talk about the history of math, not trying to tell you how things came. I'm going to try something different, maybe I'm going to fail, but I'm going to try uh, to tell you a little bit about what I do, and also to make you think a little bit about math, actively. So don't be afraid, I will not mark anybody, or <laughs> but, but we are going to think a little bit about math. And in math, one thing that we do is that we try to find links between different things that at first sight may not look like they are connected. And I chose to illustrate that through the following four objects. So one is called the Hex game. It's an actual game that you can find uh, online, and uh, which I will uh, explain to you has a connection to coffee. Oh, that's cute. This uh, <laughs> purple thing is cute. Okay, good. So, uh, coffee, magnetism, and melting of polar ice. Okay, so this maybe at first sight, any normal person would not think there is a connection between these four things, but I'm going to try to illustrate for you the connection and show how, how we make it. Okay, so I'm going to start with the hex game because let's have fun first. So the hex game is a game that you play on a, on a board of this kind, made of hexagons. There are two players, a yellow and a blue one. And each player colors a uh, hexagon one after the other. And the goal for the first player, I will call it Anael, um, is to create a blue path from bottom to top. And the goal for the yellow player, I will call it Bastien, is to uh, create a path of yellow from left to right. So you see that, in some sense, you start already to feel that they are trying to do two things that are quite different. So let me just illustrate. So this is kind of a possible game. So again, they play one after each other. They play wherever they want. Of course, once an hexagon is colored, you do not color it again in another color. This is called cheating. And uh, I'm trying to explain my daughter, Anael, <laughs> about that. But, um, and for instance, if you reach this point, bam, there is a pass, yellow pass from left to right. So Bastien won the game. Okay? So first question for you. Do you think there is always a winner in this game? So who thinks there is always a winner in this game? 
You know, there are many games where you can do a draw, okay? So we have a few person. Uh, the people that know about these things are not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who thinks there, is, there can be a draw in this game? Okay, who didn't understand that you had to answer one of the two <laughs> questions? <laughs> okay, so I love this question because the majority of people answer the wrong thing, which is always what you are seeking for when you are a mathematician. So uh, the majority of people said that you can make a draw, and I'm going to show to you afterwards in the next slide that you cannot make a draw. It's always one of the two that wins. And when you have this kind of game, there is a natural question that spikes the curious mind, or the mathematician, uh, is, well, is there an optimal way of playing? Is there a way for one of the two players, you know, kind of a recipe, how to play in order to be certain that whatever the second player plays or the first player plays, whatever, it can be as good as he wants or she wants, he will, they will never manage to beat you. So this is a question which is much harder than the question of whether there is a winner or not. And we are going to go to this at the very end of the, uh, the talk. So, if you want, if you are bored during the talk, you can think, okay, how would I play optimally at this game? And is there a way to play optimally at this game? Okay, so uh, by the way, very, I took a five by five, but I mean, if you play on a five by five board, you are going to be bored very quickly. So in fact, usually you play on much bigger boards, at least a nine by nine, and you can even imagine a much bigger boards. Okay, so is there always a winner? I'm going to prove to you that this is indeed the case. And I'm going to do it just by a drawing. And this is something that is quite common in mathematics, is that you first try to have a mental image of what you want to prove, a mental justification of what you want to prove, and then you translate this into a proof. So you are lucky. I mean, most of you are not mathematicians, so I'm not allowed, apparently to give you the full proof, so you will only have the mental image. It's good for everybody, don't worry. So the mental image will be the following. So imagine that there is a draw. If there is a draw, you agree that this can only happen once we have colored all the hexagons, and then, well, there is no blue pass from top to bottom, and no yellow pass from left to right. So imagine there is no blue pass from top to bottom, and in order to see things a little bit better, I'm going to draw in white, I mean, in, in lighter blue, all the blue hexagons that are not connected to the bottom by a blue path. Okay? So the, the, the dark blue are those that are connected to the bottom, and because there is no pass from bottom to top, it means that there is no blue hexagon at the top, like dark blue. But notice that once you see that like that, there is actually something happening that above the dark blue hexagons, there is a path of yellow going from left to right. So in fact, the non-existence of a blue path from top to bottom necessarily enforces the fact that there is a blocking path of yellow from, from left to right. So if blue doesn't win, yellow wins. Okay? Math is easy, right? Or not, I don't know. <laughs> I should be careful. Um, okay, so now imagine that you are at home alone on Sunday evening, internet is down, you know. I mean, usually I say that to high school students, they start panicking, you know. I mean, can really internet be down? I mean, <laughs> what do you do in this case? So what you do in this case is that you take your board game and you play alone. So a way of playing alone is the following. It's not a very interesting game, I must be honest, but uh, it serves my uh, pedagogical purpose. Don't fall. <laughs> I see that. Uh, okay, so uh, what you do is that you are going to color at random the hexagons. So you take uh, a coin, a random coin. So I chose a Fields medal just that you see it. So this is, <laughs> this is the face of the Fields medal, and this is... Uh, well, I will never get there, but I mean, this is uh, the other side, the tail, and if it's face, you color in yellow your, your, your hexagon, if it's tail, you color it in blue, and you do it for every hexagon. So here, you do it, say, for the first one, you take another one. The order, by the way, doesn't influence anything. You choose your hexagon as you want, but for every single time, hexagon, you send, you, you throw, you toss your coin, and you color it in yellow if it's face, on blue if it's tail. Okay, you do that for all the hexagons, and at the very end, you get a random coloring of your board game. And the question is, who is winning? So in this picture, I think you all agree who is winning? The blue, 
right? The blue won this game. There is a pass from bottom to top. But you will also agree that, well, if I would have tossed all the coins, I may have ended up with another answer. I mean, for instance, if I'm very lucky or unlucky, depending if I like blue or yellow, I could, you know, always toss on face and get only yellow things. By the way, if you do that, rethink about uh, the way you toss your coins, because <laughs> probably there is a problem. But the, 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 the answer depends on the tosses, so it depends on what we call the randomness, inherent to the fact that I cannot predict what is on. So the right question in this case is not who is winning, because it's not systematically the same person, it's what's the probability that one of the players wins. So what's the probability that the blue wins, for instance? So do you have an idea? I'm not going to do all the work. You also have to think. <laughs> so do you have an idea what's the answer? Yes? 50-50. Very good. Right, that's, uh, we are in ETH. Right, that's, <laughs> uh, OK, so the next question is why? This usually people start to be a little bit uh, less uh, confident. So why is it 50% of uh, winning? Yes? Oh, we are already in ETH. Okay. <laughs> I see. Okay, so all my standard questions fall apart because people give me the right answer immediately. Okay, very good. So usually I get, just because maybe some people didn't dare, so this is the right answer, but some people didn't dare maybe. Usually I get because the coin is falling on tail or face 50% of the time, right? Which is a fair uh, comment. Except imagine for a moment that, for instance, the board will be made only of the last column, like the one on the left. You know, it will be just one hexagon on top of each other. You agree that in this case, for the blue to win, you will need all the hexagons to be blue, while the yellow will only need one of the hexagons to be yellow. So clearly, in this case, you will not predict that it's 50-50. It will be much harder for the blue to win. Uh, so it has something that goes beyond the fact that the hexagons are uh, chosen to be blue or yellow with the same probability. It indeed has to do with the shape of the, of the board. So I usually ask people to do like that, but well, now it's, it's, uh, it makes no sense. So there is a symmetry in the board, and what I just did here is that I showed you the symmetry if I rotate the board, then the blue is trying to make a pass from left to right and the yellow from top to bottom in the same board, I mean, a reflection of the board. So clearly, the two people are playing exactly the same game. There is a symmetry. They have the same probability of winning. And because one of the two wins, that means that the sum of the two must be 100%. So it's 50% for each. OK? So mathematics is really easy, right? In ETH. <laughs> I can tell you that not in every uh, place. But uh, OK, so 50%. Yeah, I put fireworks because I can do it now. You, know, you reach a point in your life where you can do whatever you want. So, <laughs> so I decided I reached <laughs> reach this point, so I'm putting uh, fireworks. OK, very good. So at this point, 50% was maybe not so hard to predict. But let me maybe make the story a little bit harder. Imagine I change the shape of my board. Imagine, for instance, I choose a rectangle. In this case, you agree that the symmetry argument, except if I have a square, and actually even that will not work that well, but this symmetry argument doesn't work anymore, right? I cannot say that the yellow is playing the same game as the blue. And I can take all the shapes. So, I mean, so I prepare this talk in France, so I always put Mbappé, because this, uh, <laughs> this is our national treasure. So, uh, so you take any shape you want, you draw hexagons in it. You choose four arcs on the boundary. You divide in blue, yellow, blue, yellow. And you want that the blue player connects from, left to, uh, from blue to blue and the yellow from yellow to yellow. OK? And there, the question is non-trivial at all, in fact. There is no symmetry anymore. So that was a question that, on a slightly different form, but roughly speaking, was asked in, 1985, uh, in 1894. Sorry. Uh, by Deverson Wood, said, OK, can you compute these probabilities explicitly? And the editor at the time had a very optimistic answer. He said, oh, uh, well, yeah, this is an interesting question. So if somebody provides us with an answer by next month, we will publish it in the next uh, 
thing. Yeah, that's, that's an editor opinion. <laughs> it's, usually everything is easy. Like, uh, do you want to write a book? No, sorry, I don't have time. Oh, no, but don't worry, it doesn't take time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that I'm trusting this one. Uh, okay, so it took 107 years to get a satisfactory answer. So, uh, 1,284 uh, uh, issues for, uh, for the people, uh, 1,284, uh, uh, I'm trying to get uh, Swiss as much as I can. Um, and the answer is the following. This is the answer. Voila, end of the talk, <laughs> everybody goes back home. Um, I, I like to put this formula because First, I see the fear in your eyes, which is always nice. Uh, <laughs> second, you would not trust me if I were, that I'm a mathematician if you don't see a formula in the talk. And, uh, and third, because I want to tell you something about, uh, about formulas that you can use next time you see a mathematician, is that, in fact, um, formulas, they tell stories. When a mathematician sees a formula, he sees more than just symbols, he sees a story behind it. And here the story is very beautiful, and I want to illustrate it. So I took my best shot at it. Voila. This is a globe. And on the globe, we see that there are latitudes and longitudes. Or well, it was the opposite, but that's fine. And um, there is a question that you can naturally ask each other is, what are the transformations of this globe that preserve these right angles? So they are very simple ones. If I rotate, you agree that if I had a right angle, when I rotate, it's still a right angle, right? I can translate it, no problem, it doesn't change. I mean, I'm saying something obvious, don't worry, don't think that I'm over, don't overthink, that's very important in math, not to overthink. So if I translate, I get the same angle. If I would even, whoa, I'm not gonna do it, but if I would try to put more air in it, it will blow up a little bit, but this right angle will remain right angles, okay? This type of transformation, they are called, uh, so I should do something like that, okay. So they are called uh, conformal maps. They just preserve the angles. And you may think, okay, there are only three kinds of conformal maps and they are easy, but just to illustrate, you know another one is that this kind of globes, you are usually facing them on a piece of uh, paper, right? And in this case, here, the transformation from this to this, is also a conformal map. It's called Mercator projection. It's a much less trivial conformal map, and it's an example that there are many more conformal maps than just the rotation, the translation, and the dilations. These conformal maps, what do they have to do with my story? They have to do something that, in fact, if I take two different shapes for the boards, okay, I take I don't know, a board in, in shape of a heart, a board in shape of Mbappé. If I can transform one into the other one by a conformal map, then the probabilities of winning are the same. So that means that there is a very deep symmetry. It's not obvious. It's really, it took 107 years to be proved. So it's not obvious, but there are many symmetries in my question. There are many boards that have the same probability of seeing the blue winning. So why is it good? Because in science in general, and in mathematics in particular, we are very much interested in symmetries, because the more symmetries, the easier it gets to manipulate or to understand the object. You have a very simple case, I don't know if you have children or, or, or siblings, but um, you will see that there is this game that you make uh, small children play, it's basically to make them learn about shapes, uh, it's this game where you need to put, you know, a ball into a disc, a cube into a square, and, and what's the first shape that, uh, that kids uh, manage to manipulate all the time? It's always the ball. Why? Because it's much more symmetric, so in some sense, it's much more, I mean, it's much easier to find the right way of putting it into the, I mean, I must say my daughter didn't find it so quickly. <laughs> it's something as an adult that is, uh, as a parent, which is very traumatizing, I find, you know, like, <laughs> She tries for like hours to put it in the wrong hole and the only like smart evolution of her tactic is to pull harder on the thing. <laughs> like, don't you want to try the hole which is just next to it, please? <laughs> I feel a little bit embarrassed. Uh, but anyway, uh, she doesn't know the shape of objects yet. It's normal that it's difficult. But um, uh, okay, so 
all of that to say that in some sense, mathematicians are like uh, kids that didn't really grow up. Uh, grow up. They, they need, in some sense, these symmetries to handle objects. And this conformal symmetry that I just mentioned is a very deep uh, symmetry that solves, uh, that allows you to understand a lot of things. And in particular, the person who did that uh, got the Fizz Medal in 2010, and uh, his name was Taisa Smirnov. Okay, so uh, up to now we reached, you survived the first uh, part of the talk. Congratulations, first. <laughs> it's, happy, it's important to be happy about yourself. So let's go to the second part. What is it used for? Like, can we use this type of things? And uh, the answer is, I mean, let me give you the, the mathematician answer first and then an answer that maybe you will like a little bit more. So mathematician called this random way of drawing, uh, of coloring uh, the board, or in general, uh, something a little bit more general, but let me uh, not discuss it too much. They called it percolation. And the reason is that you can understand porosity of, materium, of materials using these kind of things. Imagine that you are facing uh, uh, a percolator. By the way, when, when, funny story, when you show that to, to kids, they, they, they don't understand that this is made to, to make coffee. They don't understand why there is no George Clooney pushing on a button uh, and the thing goes well. Uh, so, so this is a percolator and basically you have water, you heat it, and the water is going to go or not go through grains of coffee. So imagine that the grains of coffee are this yellow hexagons, or brown hexagon in this case. If yellow wins, then water will never manage to go through, the, uh, through the, the, the coffee and you will not get anything on the other side. If, on the contrary, blue wins, then water can go through it, it calls down, so it gets the aromas of, uh, of uh, I mean, the taste of, of coffee, and then when it reaches the top, it gets colder and then uh, condensate again into, uh, into some nice coffee, and that's that mathematician likes this a lot. So that's why we called it percolation, but in some sense, it's much more than just trying to model what happens in your coffee uh, machine. It's actually about understanding porosity of material in general. It's very good to understand how a porous media behaves when you pump water or a gas into it. So it can be coal, it can be, for instance, ice. So here is another application. It's done, I mean, it's due to Kenneth Golden. So Kenneth Golden is a professor that goes every year uh, to uh, Antarctica to uh, uh, make uh, carrots of, I don't know if this is the name in English, but I mean, tubes of, of ice. And uh, his goal is to understand the following phenomenon. When r the sun is, is uh, hitting uh, the, the ice and uh, the uh, uh, very thin, very, very thin pellicle of, of water, just, I mean, of ice gets to water at uh, melts and gets to water at the surface. But this thin pellicle of water now is going to percolate through the holes in the ice. Up to now, no problem, but the problem comes when this water gets below freezing temperature again which can happen if temperatures go down. I mean, before I was uh, saying when the night comes down, and then somebody made me notice that in Antarctica you may have to wait for a long time before having... <laughs> so I'm a mathematician, not a geographer <laughs> expert. But uh, so when water so, gets below freezing temperature, then you have a problem, which is this water is freezing again, ice takes more space than, uh, than uh, water, and when it does that, when it gets to ice again, then it breaks even more, it makes the holes even bigger, and it creates uh, 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 like more holes in water, which makes it faster for it to, uh, to melt, right? That's what you know very well when you put uh, a big uh, ice uh, in, a, in, a, in your um, glass of uh, water. It will melt very slowly. If you, you know, already uh, crush it in all uh, different ways, it will melt very quickly. Well, there is an accelerating effect of this uh, kind for melting of ice, and you can study it through percolation. This is one more example. There are many, many applications of percolation, but I want to go a little bit to the third uh, part of the talk, which is related to my research. And this third part is going to be introducing a new player 
which is the notion of phase transition. So what's a phase transition? It's a brutal change of behavior of your system when you change the parameters. Okay? You know a phase transition is exactly water going to ice or to vapor at zero and 100 uh, degrees. This is really something that uh, uh, arrives very brutally. At 0 0.001 uh, degrees, you get water. At minus 0 0.001 degrees, you get ice. Okay? So brutal change of behavior. I don't study this phase transition. I study another one that you may not know, so let me prove to you that it exists. So this is an experiment by myself. So it's, it's a poor man experiment. I was forbidden to use bigger lighters uh, by the physicists in my university. So I, uh, I, I use this thing. And uh, so what I do is that I heat a magnet. OK? I heat a magnet. Uh, so, so you are going to notice that there is a real question, which is, is he going to burn himself or not? <laughs> and I can tell you this happened to me several times before I managed to do this, uh, this video. But well, history will never remember that. Or maybe now it will. But yeah, what happens is that at a certain temperature, the magnet falls because simply it stopped to be a magnet. Okay, so there is a temperature. It's called Curie temperature at which magnets stop to be magnetized. Okay, this uh, stop to be magnetized. So this is something a little bit strange. Why the temperature will have an impact on the property of being a magnet or not? So this is a, a, a temperature that we call Curie's temperature for Pierre Curie. And I love to show this picture because, uh, you know, it's a picture where, I mean, we didn't have smartphones, I think, at this time. I mean, I'm not good historian, but this, I think, uh, I control. So it was taking a long time to do this type of pictures. And I, I can already guess, you know, a look at Irene Joliot-Curie. I mean, she looks so happy to be here, right? <laughs> so, so the parents probably, I must say, Marie doesn't look much happier to be here, but I mean, when they discover the picture, thinking, oh gosh, <laughs> the guy took two hours to take this picture and we cannot take a second one. And, and you know, 100 years later, somebody will give a talk in ETH and show this picture. Uh, so anyway, it's four, four Nobel Prize, two uh, female Nobel Prize uh, winners in physics. So beautiful um, picture. Okay, so what's the connection with my work is that in mathematics, what we try to do is we try to understand this type of phase transitions through modeling. We do mathematical models, and in particular, what we do here is that we are going to imagine that our magnet is a collection of like billions of billions of billions of tiny magnets. Okay. In fact, these things should be the magnetic moments of, of, electron, I mean, uh, of electrons in atoms. Let's not, for, let's not really bother about that and just think a huge magnet is like a collection of many, many small magnets. And when you, when you look at this, you can wonder, OK, these small magnets, they want to align, like big magnets. And what is the impact of temperature on their behavior? So maybe let me first ask uh, another question. What is temperature in general? Does somebody know? Yes? Yeah, very good. Very good. We are still in ETH. Good. <laughs> no quantum leap. Uh, very good. So it's the excitation, the vibration of atoms. By the way, does, did somebody already ask himself at which speed does the, I mean, do the atom go in this room? The molecules in the air, for instance, how fast do they go? I learned that from a, a, a very interesting talk and, um, uh, by, by a Nobel Prize. And I think, I mean, I remember it forever, so I'm going to tell it to you and hope that at least you will remember something forever. It basically goes to the speed of sound. And it makes sense, right? Because that sound is still a wave going through my medium, so it's, it depends how you measure it. It's not exactly speed of sound, but it's very close to. So it's of the order of magnitude. So you can think, you know, uh, order of like 1,000, um, between 1,000 and 2,000 um, kilometers an hour. Okay? So as a speed of sound. But again, there are different ways of measuring. I don't want to enter into this. If you go to very cold temperature, now you know that I'm sure here there are like specialists of that. If you go to very, very cold temperature, there are traps where you can manage to reach tiny, tiny like temperatures that are extremely close to absolute zero, minus two, uh, blah, blah, 273. And the thing is that there, the atoms go so slowly that it will take them like an hour to just exit 
says this rule. So that really, I mean, this is a concrete way of measuring temperature, like the impact of temperature as excitation of, of, uh, of molecules. So here, our atoms are not going to move. I mean, the, the displacement of the atoms of these small magnets is not what, happen, what, what is uh, relevant. What is relevant is how much they want to align with their neighbors. So they want to align, but when you increase the temperature, they are more and more disturbed. You know, they are less and less listening to the rules, and they may disalign. And what happens, so let's say, for instance, now you are a beautiful uh, magnet almost at zero temperature. You all look towards me. But if we turn on the temperature and increase it, you know, some people will start to think, oh, I don't want to listen to this talk anymore. It's not an encouragement. Huh? It's, <laughs> I'm always careful about this. Uh, small prints, you know. Uh, so, and maybe you start looking on the other side, like to the back. And if it starts increasing and more and more people start to do that, you may reach a point where even people that want to align with their neighbors will have more neighbors looking at the back than looking in front. So these people will start watching at the back as well, and there will be a point where basically half of the people will be looking at the back, half of the people are looking towards me, and this is a point of breaking of magnetism. Because in some sense, you should think that there is a kind of collective push of all these smaller uh, magnets, but if half of them are pointing in one direction, half of them in the other one, then you get zero pull. Okay? So I explained to you the image again, and again, you are lucky, you are non-mathematician, so you are not going to have the full proof. But there is a mathematical proof of this, this image. And this proof, I mean, there are different ways of looking at it, but there is, there is a way to connect it to percolation theory again. Imagine that you took your small uh, magnets and you put them regularly on the faces of, uh, of a grid. Then you may want to color in blue the faces that have a magnet pointing in one direction, and in red, pointing in the other direction. And if you do that on a big magnet, you will end up with a picture of this kind. And here, okay, it's blue and red, okay, it's squares, not hexagons, but you may think that there is some kind of connection between the two objects. You can ask yourself the same question. Is it the blue that wins? I mean, how big are the connected components of red, of yellow, etc., etc. And in fact, looking at the two models with the same idea, the same kind of collect, I mean, um, uh, let's say the, the same universal vision is actually going to give you a lot of information on magnetism, on the Ising model. So by studying the Ising model using percolation theory, you can understand a lot of things. And let me give you one example of things that you can understand. Like that, you have one theorem that you will not remember your whole life. That's fine. <laughs> I, I, I can live with that. But uh, So the theorem is the following. It says, if you take this way of looking at magnets, it's called the Ising model, and you take it in three dimensions. So you look at a three-dimensional object. What the theorem is saying is that the phase transition of this object is continuous. So let me tell you what that means. Let me give you an example of a discontinuous phase transition. That's always how a mathematician explains you something by telling you what it's not. So this is not a continuous phase transition. How was it illustrated? So I plug the volume in terms of the temperature for water. And if there are chemists in the room, I know this is not the shape of the <laughs> volume of water in terms of, uh, uh, of temperature. I tried to tell it several times to the person who made this, but it's like, you know, it goes from colder, to, I mean, from hotter to colder, which is a very strange way to put the... Uh, well, anyway, uh, so here the important thing is that volume moves continuously, but at zero degree, when it becomes ice, there is a jump. There is a real jump. You cannot just keep going continuously. It's a discontinuous phase transition. It's even more extreme for vapor, right? And that's the whole concept of a machine based on, on vapor. Uh, when you do the same for real magnets, like real life magnets, and you plug the strength of the magnet as a temperature, as a function of the temperature, then what you will see, and you can actually see it, I mean, Curie made a lot of experiments around that. So what you see is that, in fact, it decays continuously to reach zero, at the point of Curie. 
and then it stays zero. So the function that you draw is continuous this time, not discontinuous. So the question is, your um, mathematical caricature of, uh, of magnets, does it behave like real-life magnets? Is it really a continuous phase transition? And this was surprisingly difficult to prove, in fact. So it took us many years, and the, the easing model is like over 100 years now, and it took like 92 years or something like that to reach this thing that the phase transition is of the same kind as what you see in real life. So the caricature is close to real life. And this is something very important because that's the beginning of, I mean, that's what justifies the notion of your model. If your model is not behaving like real life, then you should change your model. Okay, so the connection between the four things, coffee, ice, magnetism, and the Higgs game, was percolation theory. And if you remember that as well, it's nice. It's this kind of connection through mathematics between very different objects. I have absolutely no clue what time it is. So, 36? Yeah. Ah, very good, because that means I can make the last experiment. Yeah, yeah. So there is a last slide. I love it, because it's an experiment on you. So, <laughs> oh, uh, sorry. Oh, I forgot you. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, 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 so this, this is a picture of uh, me with my two favorite collaborators uh, on the day of the Fizz Medal. And because one is here, I, mean, I wanted to show this picture. They look happy, right? I mean, we were happy on this day. Um, because, I mean, math is before everything a collaboration thing. And this, this, uh, this, I mean, it's a little bit like Nobel Prize. Uh, the fifth medal at the end is a personal uh, award, but it comes to, you know, give, uh, I mean, it gives credit to a whole group of collaborators usually and, a whole colla and also a whole community. So this is the first step. It's the collaborators, and then there is a whole community uh, behind it. Okay. Back to X game, so the experiment, yes. So I, I like this experiment because what I want to illustrate through this is the following. So I'm going to prove something to you. So you are not mathematician, but still I'm going to prove something. Uh, and I want to do it because I feel like, I mean, many people feel I'm not the first one to think that, but we live in a, in a world where we want to understand things immediately. And this is very far from what we do in math and what scientists do in general. And by the way, that's also one of the reasons that made maybe the you know, discussion between scientists and the public difficult during the pandemic is that the people, the people actually discovered, like citizens discovered research. They were only facing science before, like the result of the process. So the process of research is a process that goes through understanding of something difficult through mistakes, and in particular, it's something that takes time. So I'm going to explain something which I'm pretty sure not all of you is going to understand. That's, that's my experiment. I mean, of course, if you all understand, we are in ETH. Who knows, you know? But <laughs> if everybody understands, my, uh, my experiment works very poorly. But so for those who will not understand immediately, I encourage you to discuss with your neighbors, not during the talk but, uh, or the questions, but later, to interact with the others, because what I can promise is that everybody can understand this at the end. There is no math involved at the end. It's a reasoning more than anything. And at the moment where you will understand, I want you to think about me, <laughs> like that, um, because you are going to normally feel super happy. <laughs> That's a, you feel much better about understanding something that you didn't understand immediately than to understand something immediately without any effort. So this is the experiment. And then don't hesitate to tell that to your kids or your friends that have difficulties in math that are maybe still learning math, that this is normal to take time to understand things, that they should not feel bad about it, and that they will be actually happier than the first of the, uh, the class that is just always understanding things uh, for the first time. I mean, on the first. Okay, so CRM, there exists a winning strategy for the first player, for Anel, for the blue. Okay? I'm going to prove that. And in order to prove that, I'm going to do something that you probably are not so used to do. I'm going to do a proof by contradiction. So what is a proof by contradiction? It's not an absurd proof. It's a proof where I assume the opposite of what I want to prove. Okay? And, well... If I assume the opposite, I'm kind of 
I think I'm assuming something wrong, so what I want to get out of this assumption is an absurd thing. If I get an absurd thing from this assumption, that means that that was wrong, and that means that what I assume in the first place was right. Usually, already at this point, people are like, Ooh, doo -doo -doo. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> So we are going to assume that this first strategy doesn't exist for the, uh, the strategy for the first player doesn't exist. And this you will agree if the first player doesn't have a winning strategy, that means that there is no way for the first player to play perfectly. So that means that the second player actually has a perfect way of playing, that he can always answer the first player to finally win at the end. So not having a winning strategy for the first player is having a winning strategy for the second player. Okay, so that's our assumption, and I want to prove that this is absurd, okay? But before I dive into the proof, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I, have, I, I understand what is a winning strategy, because maybe for you it's a little bit like still uh, abstract at this stage. So I'm going to show you my mental image of a winning strategy. It may not be the same as yours, but try to create your own afterwards. So my image of a winning strategy, it's, you know, these, these books that you are the hero from, of. You know, I don't know if uh, you remember this. It apparently doesn't exist anymore. It's called a video game. But, I mean, at the time, uh, at my age, we had these books. It was usually in a horror uh, house. You know, you would have, like, if you want to take this, uh, this door, go to page 36. If you want to go up the stairs, go to page uh, 49. Then you go up the stairs, uh, you go to page 49, you are dead. Uh, usually you go back to the previous one. Oof. And uh, you go back, and oh, finally it was 36. So this is, a, this is a book that you are the hero of. And basically, a strategy, uh, a winning strategy is kind of a book like that except that you are not the person who chooses where you go, it's the other player who is the person that chooses where you go. So basically, the first page of the book would be something like that, where you will have an empty board, and on the right page, there will be like, if player one plays hexagon uh, one, like the first phase, go to page blah, blah. If it plays hexagon two, sorry, I just copy-pasted, I think. Uh, <laughs> Not smart, this one. Uh, if player one plays hexagon two, go to page blah, blah. If it plays hexagon three, go to page blah, blah. Okay? So let's imagine that it plays hexagon uh, 39, say. So you go to page uh, blah, blah. And there, there is the red, there is a hexagon there, which is exactly, why is it changing colors? Right? Interesting. Um, so there is the blue hexagon that the first player played. And there, the, game, the, the book tells you, well, then, as a second player, you should play here. OK? I mean, you understood that I cannot tame, but... Um, uh, and then it says, well, now, if player one, one plays hexagon one, go to page blah, blah. If it's hexagon two, go to page... And so on and so on. So in some sense, your, your book is going to show you all the possible ways of playing. And always, as a second player, it will tell you, play here and then wait. Okay, now if the first player plays there, go to page blah, blah, and then, okay, play here and then, etc., etc. And it's a winning strategy because it will always end by you winning. So it's a, it's a good book, right? So why this book cannot exist? Well, I claim that if this book exists, then we are facing a big problem because the first player, the blue, can play the following thing. It can say, Let's say I play in the middle, but now I forget that I played. And I imagine that I'm the second player. So I take the book. It's not a private book. Eh? Everybody has access to this book. And I follow the rules of this book. But then he's going to win. He or she is going to win, right? The blue is going to win because it follows the winning strategy. And the worst that can happen that maybe the winning strategy may tell you play in the middle. And you know, blue already played in the middle. But if they already, he already played in the middle, he can play somewhere else and forget that he played there and keeps going like that. So if the winning, I see already that my experiment worked. <laughs> and so some people look lost. That's my fault, not yours. But at least you will have the happy moment later. So if this winning strategy in Hex game uh, exists, this book exists, then both the first and the second player will win, but this is impossible. So that's absurd, and that means that the book doesn't exist. Okay? So, of course, this is a mental image 
of what is a winning strategy. This book would have to have like so many pages, and I think I, I, I looked at it, but the number of possible games is like well above the number of atoms in the universe, so this would be a very big book. Huh? So, but it's a mental image to try to understand what we are doing. Okay, well, you survived, congratulations. You have the right to have nice pictures. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm going to answer your questions. Oh, okay. We are sitting. Ah. Ooh. It's nice to be sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> True. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Diego, for the nice uh, journey from the coffee room to the Antarctica. Uh, and uh, we were very happy and lucky to have you uh, sharing your precious time. And we have even the chance to have you a bit more. So, for questions, so don't hesitate. Yes. yes. Uh, so, yeah, you're in the center. Why you are walking, I'm going to sing something. Da, 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 I do the bass. <laughs> yeah, please go hurry because I'm not a good singer. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Neither am I. Um, do you need some symmetry assumptions on the playing field so that the theorem holds? Uh, for, yes, yes, exactly, because in some, the last theorem you mean, yes. Yes, you, you need, because I, I lied a little bit to you when I'm saying that you play once. I, I lie to you a lot. Okay, that's it. just know about that. It's better <laughs> disclaimer for you. Uh, but um, yeah, so when I said you apply the, the book of the blue, uh, of the second player, in fact, I'm not on the same board, right? I'm still trying to create a pass from bottom to top, while before it was from left to right. So there, what I'm truly meaning is you apply the book looking at your board like that. Right? So you need the symmetry at this point, otherwise it will not work. And by the way, if you look at just uh, the column uh, thing, then clearly uh, that would be the, blue, the yellow that will have a winning strategy. So you need a very yes. motivated translator. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Other questions? Yes. I like these moments of running and... <laughs> It allows you to, you know, calm your, uh, your brain. And, uh, yeah, yes. um, in your previous proof, you said that there exists a winning strategy. Yes. Um, but it, it's a proof by contradiction, so I don't know what is the winning strategy. Do you have a way to transform this proof into a constructive proof? That's a very uh, interesting uh, question. It's so interesting that normally I should have mentioned that in the talk, <laughs> but I just forgot. So, yeah, there is something very strange that happened here, and uh, in fact very interesting, that we prove the existence of an object without describing it, right? I have zero information on how it looks. And in fact, in this hex game, we have, even with the help of computers, we have exact, explicit winning strategies only for very small boards. So I think it gets up to nine, which was the picture there. Maybe 10 is fine, but I mean, 13, we don't know how the winning strategy looks. So it's a non-constructive uh, proof, and indeed it's not so easy to, uh, to see how to, uh, to get a merely uh, close to optimal strategy. So, for instance, I was also thinking that maybe that's a good game to, um, to try to run computers to learn about this game. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's easy to, uh, to code. And, uh, I mean, not for me, but, I mean, for people that know how to handle a computer. And, um, and basically, you could think, you know, it's much simpler than chess, and there should be, uh, like, the, the computer should start playing super well, super quickly. In fact, it's not so much the case. It's, uh, I mean, like n good human players still manage to win on, uh, uh, I mean, basically on bad computer programs. The very best now beats uh, the human, but not by so, so much. So you see, even just trying to approximate the winning strategy using a computer program is not so easy. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, a case of a simple rule that led to very complex and subtle uh, game. Thank you very much. I should be rewarded. He's the closest one. He's the only one who dared to. Uh... Um, how, do, how do we know that percolation 
is a good model for porosity of material. Ah. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, we should have asked ourselves this question. I, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I think we need to rethink our uh, career. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to study. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true that, so I'm going to first give you the non-politically correct answer, which is that I don't care so much. <laughs> it's a beautiful mathematical model, so in some sense, this is my main motivation. Now, it happens indeed that when you look at the numerics, you, you can co, I mean, you can see that it's, close to, in particular, at criticality. So exactly at the point of, uh, so I didn't tell you what is the phase transition for percolation itself, but in some sense, you can change the probability that each hexagon is blue or yellow. And in fact, P equal one half, so when you say that it has the same chance of being blue or yellow, is the most interesting case because it's exactly the case where the phase transition occurs. The drastic change of behavior between blue winning and yellow winning. And there you can, for instance, try to measure certain quantities in the system. You see very fractal uh, boundaries appearing and you can look at the, the critical exponents related to these things. There are systems of por porous medium that have similar critical exponents. The critical exponents are, in, I mean, so these numbers that you compute. Critical exponents are particularly interesting because they are called universal. And when you look at a model like that, you may wonder, but I mean, why did you choose hexagons? Why did you choose squares? You know, I mean, at the end, it's a very uh, arbitrary choice. So, I mean, a physicist should complain. So first, the physicists cannot complain. They came up with a model, usually. <laughs> so, so they are responsible for their own faith. But, um, but the, the point is that what is interesting, in fact, is that the behavior, in particular, at the, exactly at the point of, uh, of phase transition, is universal in the sense that it doesn't depend on the details of your model. So this was observed already by physicists a long time ago, and that's why they justify the use of mathematical models to understand uh, statistical physics systems, so, because exactly these universal properties are shared by the natural system and by the, the mathematical model. That was, I didn't answer the question, but that's fine. <laughs> Hello, I will, th I will try to understand your experiment about uh, the minimum initial start strategy. So you, uh, you, I think it's very true if uh, the two players use uh, the same winning book, yeah. there will be no winner. But yeah. it could be, there could be uh, two different winning books. Yes, but that would be fine because it would still lead to the fact that they should both win, right? The way, I mean, indeed, you, there is a priori non-uniqueness of the winning strategies. That's completely true. Uh, but, but that's fine. As long as both follow a winning strategy, there is a problem, right? Because both winning strategies should guarantee that the player in question is going to win. So you don't need that it's the same thing. It happens that the proof relies on the fact that you are going to use roughly the same, but this was not mandatory. You could use another book telling you about the winning strategy. I have a similar question to the, to the previous guy. Uh, why, why that game has chosen the hexagon, hexagon for, for the... Yes, that, that, that's... that's the, mo the most easy, the easiest form to, to, create, to create the passage or... Yeah, I mean, so that's a good question. Why, why did we use hexagons? Um, in fact, you don't have to. You can also use octagons and look at a special uh, rule. Uh, but the, the, the point is that you want something that is uh, what we call self-dual. That's a cute name. It means that you should have that both players play roughly the same game. Imagine I use squares. Instead of hexagons. If I use squares, what is going to happen is that in order to block a pass of blue from top to bottom, sometimes the yellow can just go diagonal. Right? It will still block. Imagine you do a pass like that, like, uh, uh, then, then you will block the blue. So the yellow is going to play a game of trying to create a path, but a completely different game with completely different rules and much simpler rules. So in this game, for instance, you would very easily have no 
yellow or blue winner if you use the same rule. And if you tell, well, then the blue has to tr create a true path, but the yellow just has to block it, then the yellow is playing a much simpler game because he's allowed to go diagonal. So the hexagons have this nice thing that it's the same game for both, creating a path among hexagons. So it uh, could be the one of the uh, uh, most difficult form to block the passage. Sorry? Mm -hmm. No, the important is that you want that it's the same difficulty for both players. The fact that it's difficult or not is not so important. It's really, is it the same rule for both players? Because you want something fair. Maybe we move to uh, okay. the next question since we have. So I think there were a question in the back there. I mean, if you can uh, do this on, on, on smaller fields, why then cannot, can it be deducted for the bigger fields? Fields, you mean uh, boards? You mean? Yeah. Oh, because it's not inductive. Having a good strategy on a board of a certain, a winning strategy on a board of a certain uh, size gives you little information on how you're going to win larger, on a larger. F it's true that it looks like, you know, a bigger, uh, a bigger board is basically made of like almost a board of the size uh, n minus one, you know, a 10 board, uh, 10 by 10 is almost a nine by nine plus something. But it's very, very difficult to understand how you would apply a winning strategy for a nine by nine to get a winning strategy for a 10 by 10. It should be something like a parabolic, uh, just you have to break it one down. Oh, uh, you want to break my boards? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, at least I don't think that people noticed, uh, I mean, know how to, to, to do something indu inductively. And in fact, many things uh, in nature and in math uh, are interesting exactly because you don't know to go easily from one side to another one. So that's, uh, here I think it's a typical example. But I mean, of course, I, my job is not to find these winning strategies. It's, uh, was more to illustrate, uh, but, but, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's not obtained inductively. Thank you very much. So I think we have to stop. Because, uh, uh, but uh, yeah. I, I, don't I, I, I don't disappear, don't worry. Yes. <laughs> go uh, so thank you very much, Hugo, for the, for the talk and also answering the question. I think you succeed a lot, like creating <laughs> uh, at least curiosity, just because most of the questions were about the last math problem. Yes, you see. And yes, so yeah, <laughs> I think you succeeded. I hope the discussion will keep going after the room, and uh, it's particular during the. There will be an apéro. I wanted to say a coffee break, but uh, no, I got a bit <laughs> in France, so an apéro just after the talk. Thank you very much for joining, and thanks a lot, Hugo. Thank you very for much.